Medina tames a cloud break. Hunt dazzles Copenhagen. Yes, everyone's counting down to Rio. And now in the newsroom, here is Andy Van Zyl. NC Sports, plunge into the action. Welcome back for the latest edition of NC Sports. I'm Andy Fonsale and it's been another busy week on the world's oceans. So let's take the tour with today's lineup. Gabriel Medina is back in contention. The Brazilian champ wins a sensational Fiji Pro cloud break and leaps up to number two on the WSL rankings. The story and the insights. Italians take all with Simone Ruffini and Rochelle Bruni at the FINA Open Water Marathon in Hungary. Lindsay Owen Jones takes the line honors with his magic carpet cubed. But it's Little Tip with Gilles Page that takes the win at the 2016 Giralia. Britain's reigning world champ Gary Hunt conquers Copenhagen at the Cliff Diving World Series. Top-notch Grand Prix sailing happening now in Cardiff for the Extreme Sailing Series and for Kiel Week in Germany. Sailor Girl adventurer and NC Sports correspondent Nick Douglas links in with the newsroom from Australia, plus a whole lot more. After a poor start in the season, 2014 world champion Medina finally got his comeback last week in Fiji on the legendary cloud break. The guys had to hang out for several extra days on the tiny Tabarua Island waiting for the right conditions. But it was all worth it with the high scores that kept on coming in. So let's go check it out. With an over 10-day delay, the WSL Men's Fiji Pro finally closed proceedings last week in Tavarua. This is the legendary cloud break, where the best pages in surfing history can and will be written. Just ask winner Gabriel Medina, now back in world title contention. Yeah, that was a crazy week, you know. Uh, we've been waiting for these waves. And uh, yeah, finally here, big. We got so many sets in the head. And it's all worth, we got some barrels, uh, the other sick event, and yeah, I'm just stoked. I'm so happy. And Wilco has been surfing amazing since uh, event one, and yeah, I don't know who can stop this guy. Good question, Gabriel. This was a memorable Fiji Pro, and the Brazilian champ showed that he could very well catch up with current number one, Matt Wilkinson. This year's underdog revelation, uh, picking up more valuable points in Fiji with a second place. BG 2016 will also be remembered for the massive barrels, the many high nines, the perfect tens by De Sosa, yes he's up there, and by Kelly Slater, third on cloud break, and now climbing back in the rankings. What an amazing Fiji Pro. Hi Jero, thank you for joining us here in studio today. Hello Andy, how are your exceptional conditions at Cloudbreak? Certainly worth the wait. Definitely, I mean I think that's what surfing is about, you know, what's the point of rushing an event, surfing in average waves when you can wait and surf the perfect wave? Well certainly it's not something that stands up with the modern logic of uh, sponsorship and commercial sports, but nevertheless uh, you have to sort of give a hats off to surfing in general because uh, they don't uh, basically subside to this sort of thing. Um, what we've seen at Cloud Break was uh, incredible, especially with the high scores. Kelly Slater was the big surprise after Medina and Matt Wilkinson because he got a third place and we had loads of high nines and perfect tens like this one from Kelly Slater. Uh, this guy just, just never seems to get any older uh, and uh, doesn't want to retire. He didn't start out too well, did he, this year with, you know, basically some low scores uh, down under, not being in Rio. So he was way down the ranking list and now he's made it back up. Yeah, well, I'm just really curious to know what would have happened if he didn't break his magic stick, as he likes to call it. Uh, definitely back on track and he was surfing amazing, I thought. Um, 
But yeah, as you said, the conditions were absolute, absolutely exceptional. And let's talk about Matt Wilkinson. I mean, I feel like everyone was waiting for the moment for him to crumble under the pressure, but he hasn't. Yet another final. Absolutely. This guy was an outsider, an off-the-wall outsider, if you wish, uh, compared to the levels uh, of the WSL, the XASP. And this seems to be his year. He's uh, still holding an 8,500-point lead. Uh, that's thanks to the back-to-back -back wins that he had uh, down under early in the season. And now Matt, uh, of course, is uh, uh, looking to stay ahead. And uh, to do so, he's actually managed a second place here in Fiji, which uh, is definitely a sign of consistency. Uh, so we hope uh, that he can keep it up. After all, no matter who it would have been there with two wins and such a big lead, everybody would have been trying to bring him down. Yeah, that's true. I mean, quite a substantial lead. But what do you think uh, Wilkinson is feeling looking in his rearview mirror and seeing Medina behind him? Well, it must be an incredible feeling for him. He had always been trailing all these years. Now he's on top. And like we said, he's got the pressure of being on top, but he's also got the luck that there's nobody really below him in the sense that they're all eating points away from each other. You know, even now, as we see, Gabriel Medina has jumped up seven positions. Um, you know, JJ Florence did great. He won the last event in Rio, so he's already taken, brought himself back up on the, on the rosters. And then we got four more Brazilians. And uh, so it's, there's no real definite leader, a real, anti-Matt Wilkinson at the moment, so maybe Medina. Yeah, well, I guess I can just throw the stats away because things are always changing. But uh, one thing is for sure is that Taj did his uh, surf his last professional heat, which um, he surfed amazing. It was such a great salute to his professional surfing career, and we're definitely going to miss him on the tour. Absolutely. He is a representative of what we can call a generational change. Of course, uh, Kelly, we all want him to stay, but it's clear that that can't go on forever. Uh, we have other people like uh, Joel Parkinson, and uh, uh, of course, Mick Fanning is taking a sabbatical this year. He's obviously up with his age as well, comparatively speaking, with the Brazilians, for example. But um, very important for him to get back at J-Bay. Yeah, really exciting news that he will be coming back. I can't wait to see what happens. Also quite a brave decision to come back. I don't know if I would do the same. <laughs> I think he has to do that. It's a little bit like getting back on the horse. And it's not just for Mick. I think for the entire community, that was a big shocker with the shark attack last year. Um, for Mick, even though he is taking a sabbatical year, it's fundamental that he gets back on the horse. It's fundamental that he gets back to the same spot, live the same situation. And of course, this year, we have a much better security situation as far as sharks is concerned. Yes, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to the event in J Bay. I'm really happy Mick's going back. He surfs the J Bay wave so well. One of my personal favorite waves, of course, being South African. Speaking of which, tell me a little bit. I mean, J Bay is the huge event that represents all of South Africa's tradition. How big is that event in South Africa? You know, for the South African surf community, it's huge. It was taken off the tour um, for a few years and then brought back on, and that really made everybody so happy. It's a huge event. Um, everybody that I know can't imagine South Africa without the J Bay wave, you know? It's a magical place. The wild surroundings just make it the perfect scenery for surfing. And I'm really, I can't wait to see it. Well, that it's important for the politics of WSL to continue uh, to uphold the traditions in the various locations down under Fiji, the US, South Africa. And uh, speaking of South Africans, of course, you have the World Surf League in the family with your brother, Davey, who had a very, very bad injury. Uh, but he's back on, uh, at least on, on the waves, tell me. Yeah, he's been training really hard. It was an unfortunate event that happened last year, um, but he worked really hard to get back to his optimal fitness level. And he actually just came back from J Bay where he was filming a surf clip showing the CT guys what they can look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, we wish him all the luck. Thank you, Jared. It's always so nice having you in studio and we'll catch up with you again soon. Well, thank you and I'll catch you next time. Italy conquers both men and women's FINA open water marathon in Hungary. Grand finale in Geneva for the Giralia Classic, while Gary Hunt reclaims his cliff diving supremacy in downtown Copenhagen. Let's hear all the latest on the NC Sports Briefs. It was a triumph of the Italians in leg three of the FINA 10K Marathon Swimming World Cup in Balatonfurt, Hungary, 
with Simone Ruffini and Raquel Bruni taking top spots on the men's and women's podiums. Sunshine and 23.4 degree waters mark the gathering of the world's elite swimmers on the shores of Lake Balaton. Olympic champion and local favorite Eva Ristoff led for most of the race in the women's camp before being overtaken by the rest of the pack, including Bruni, with two kilometers left to go. American Haley Anderson grabbed silver, a full 11 seconds behind the Italian, followed by Isabel Harley from Germany, who narrowly beat out Brazilian Anna Marcella by 0.8 seconds to capture the bronze. On the men's side, four swimmers crossed the finish line within three seconds of each other, with Ruffini clocking in at 1 hour 50 minutes 25.04 seconds, 1.75 seconds ahead of German Andreas Wachberger, and 2.13 seconds ahead of Canadian Richard Weinberger. Marathon swimmers are now packing their bags for Rio 2016. Thirty to thirty-five knots of wind and high seas swept the northern Mediterranean last week as the 180 yachts of the Giralia fleet left the Saint Tropez to round the famous Corsican rock on their way to Genova. As Lindsay Owen Jones, owner of L'Oréal and his 100-foot Wally Magic Carpet Cube, uh, crossed the finish line for real-time honors, a heavy damage report ensued uh, by joint organizers at Yacht Club Italiano and uh, Yacht Club de France, uh, with several crews abandoning the race, including the Mariel team, rescued via helicopter by the Italian Coast Guard. Following corrected time calculations, Gilles Page and his crew on tip a Sunfast 3600 were declared overall winners of this 64th edition of the Giralia Rolex Cup Classic. Five-time champion Gary Hunt set a new personal record high score as he captured his first win of the 2016 Cliff Diving World Series in Copenhagen. Diving from a specially built 28-meter platform atop the Danish capital's opera house, the Brit wowed judges and the more than 40,000 fans below with his signature back three somersaults, four twists, free dive. Wildcard Chris Kalanis from Poland, who finished 10th in the season opener in Texas, picked up the second highest score of the day, while round one winner Mexican Jonathan Paredes took the third spot on the podium to maintain his overall lead in the series. Hunt now moves into second overall, followed by Michael Navratil from the Czech Republic. From the cold and windy climbs of the Northern Baltic, the series heads to the Portuguese Azores on July 9th in what will be round three for the men and round two for the women who have two less stops this season. In the second part of this edition, the Extreme Sailing Series in Cardiff, Kille Woche on the Baltic, VX1's Down Under, NC Sports Sailor Girl Nick Douglas joins us in studio for some insights. We'll be right back after the break. Major Grand Prix events happening now on the World Sailing Circuit with the GC32s flying in Cardiff Bay at the 2016 Extreme Sailing Series. And Germany's Kiel Week closing its spectacular sailfest on the Baltic this weekend. Let's first check out the recap. And when we come back, Nick Douglas will be joining us in studio for all the insights. After two legs in Muscat and Chindao, the Extreme Sailing Series gets set for a third showdown in Cardiff over the weekend. Act 3 will see the hydrofoiling GC32s battling out on super flat water, making extremely fast even faster. Series leaders Oman Air will be seeking to extend their two-point lead over Alingian Red Bull, who are tied in second place with 21 points, ahead of Land Rover Bar Academy at 19. Rounding out this year's roster are SAP, Sail Portugal and China One, 
all of whom have yet to capture a podium finish. Cardiff is the only UK stop in this 10th edition of the series that features a combination of open water and stadium events. Kielerwache, the world's largest sailing jamboree, is underway on the northern shores of Germany. This year marks the 134th edition of the Mother of All Regattas, with 4,000 sailors, 2,000 boats and 3 million fans expected to attend. A total of 1,700 events, including 360 regattas covering the entire spectrum of classes, a windjammer parade of freighters from the 19th century, and a gala send-off of the National German Olympic and Paralympic sailing team are all on the agenda of the week-long Kermesse, and Nautical Channel will be bringing you full reports in the next edition. And now, NC Sports correspondent Nick Douglas will be linking up with us in the studio for an all-new Sailor Girl adventure. Hi, Nick. Welcome back to NC Sports. Hi, Andy. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Uh, we have so much we want to hear from you. But let's start off with the Extreme Sailing Series down in Cardiff. And Kiel is in full swing in Germany. But let's take it from the top. What's your take on the new ESS flying season on the GC32s? Who do you think is going to take home the win in Cardiff? Oh, it's, it's a hard one, I have to say. There's only been two events so far on the new GC32 circuit. I mean, everything's going foiling, so it's got to be better, doesn't it? But I know that Oman Air are definitely off to a, a really a really quick start, and they're skippered by Morgan Larson, who took out the Extreme Sailing Series in 2014, but then transferred over to the GC32. So he's had a season under his belt. But I don't think you can discount uh, the, the new team, China One that's skippered by Taylor Canfield. He's having a ripping season on the M32s, that's for sure. Yeah. And I, I have to say, Cardiff was a fantastic event last year. It's known for its tight race tracks. And I know that Red Bull really was a crowd favorite on the final day of racing, skippered by Jason Waterhouse, who's in Rio training now for the upcoming games. Uh, he managed to win one of the races on the final day, even with a capsize, which was just fantastic. Great acting. And let's talk a little bit about Kiel. I mean, it's an annual classic. You've had your fair share of success there. Um, but this is the real last event before Rio. So it's a really significant one, isn't it? It is a really significant one. And Kiel Awash is just huge. There's 42 classes involved with the event, not just the Olympic classes. And I do know that a number of the German sailors that are heading to Rio, as well as Scandinavian teams, are using it as their final warm-up, which is great to see. A lot of other teams, uh, the British and the Australians and the US, are already in Rio and, and training because that event starts in about six weeks. It's getting exciting. Yeah, really. uh, 5th of August, I believe, the Olympic starts, which is just fantastic. Myself, Kiel, uh, very fond memories. 2009 managed to take out the first women's match racing event there. There were 34 teams as we were right at the start of the 2012 cycle. So, yeah, absolutely massive event, not just in Olympic sport, that's for sure. Well, it's so fantastic to have you linking up with us, Nick. Um, such a really experienced sailor. So, and I also understand that you've been covering many very important events down under in Australia. So tell us a little bit about those. Oh, most definitely. It's, a, it's an interesting time in Australia because it is winter for us down here. So we have a lot of events that head north. The VX1 Midwinter Nationals was the most recent event that I was on the ground for. The biggest fleet that we've seen so far in Australia in this new and exciting one design class. It is a sports boat, a keel boat, but I think we can almost call it a dinghy because there's plenty of capsizes in action. And, and Brett Whitbread managed to walk away with that title. He um, was, was very dominant, which was fantastic to see. And uh, I was also in Royal Geelong Yacht Club for their presentation night ahead of being an ambassador for the festivals, Festival of Sales, which is a huge event here in Australia, which takes place on Australia Day, which is sort of, uh, I guess, our Federation Day as such, which is in, in January, which will be awesome. And speaking of Australia, you guys have managed to rank up 26 medals at the Sailing World Cup this season. I mean, it's pretty impressive, second overall uh, next to Britain. Um, what's your assessment of the team now going into Rio? The Australian sailing team are in a huge, huge wave of momentum essentially leading into Rio. Um, we've got 
Jason Waterhouse and Lisa Darmanin, who are going exceptionally well in the NACRA 17. Matt Belcher and Will Ryan have been an absolute dominant force in the 470, though they did have a third, I believe, in the recent Europeans. So they've got plenty to work on leading into the games. And I, I know that the Australians are looking to try and beat their tally from last time, which is a, a big task to undertake, given that it was our most successful Olympics. And sailing won more gold medals for Australia than any other sport, which is huge. But that said, I know that the British and also the, uh, the Americans will be bringing it hard as, as will uh, the, the Dutch and also the Belgian in, in a number of other classes. It's, it's difficult to say what will happen because Rio conditions are looking exceptionally tricky and light, which is quite different to a lot of the other World Cup events that we've seen this season. So it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, lots of uh, competition to come. And speaking of competition, there will of course also be a big battle between the 49ers, between Outridge and Peter Burling. From the Olympics to the America's Cup, these two have always been heads on. Yeah, I think that everybody loves seeing these two go head to head. Pete Burling is still leading the America's Cup World Series, so he's got that edge over Nath Outeridge. But Nath did manage to take Artemis Racing to a win in the most recent event in Chicago. So you never know what will happen there either. I would have to say, though, that Pete Burling is probably the favourite going into the Olympics in the 49er class, as much as I hate to say that as an Aussie. I mean, himself and Blair Chuk, I think, are undefeated in... 20 events in the 49er so far. Wow. Uh, it may even be more, I, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, but it's an unbelievable feat. Uh, but I, I hope that we see those two take out gold and silver of being a Southern Hemisphere junkie. <laughs> Absolutely. And Nick, my last question for you is, Rio's just around the corner. What are the sailors saying about the Maria de Gloria race course at the moment? I hear they did have a big cleanup, but is the health and safety concern still there? I know that the health and safety in Rio has been something that's been top of mind. In, in water pollution, unfortunately, is becoming a bigger issue for sailors around the world. I mean, it's something that we've seen in, in a number of places. Even in Qingdao in 2008, it wasn't necessarily pollution, but there was weed on the course. So it's always something that we have to deal with, I think. I think what's more concerning for me is the fact that Liesl Tesh, who was a gold medalist in the Paralympic Games in the Scud class for Australia, she was actually attacked this morning in Rio and she had her bike stolen from her, which is um, concerning. She was with a friend as well and there were bystanders that, that just watched the entire event happen. So I think that's even a concern in Rio and I know that they're now going to up the security for the, for the Olympians in a number of areas, but I mean, there's, there's a little bit of unrest and now uncertainty amongst the, the athletes in terms of safety. So uh, yeah, on the land as well as on the water. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, safety obviously comes first and we really wish all the sailors going to the Rio Olympic Games the very best of luck and to be safe. Nick, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We really look forward to catching up with you again for um, some more of your stories and more of your reports. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully I can touch base with you when I'm in Cows very, very soon. <laughs> Definitely. Bye-bye. Till then. Solar One, the 100% sustainable race, is back in Monte Carlo. Taylor Canfield readies up for the big world match race tour final in Sweden. And as mentioned, the WSL J-Bay Pro hits South Africa. Mark the dates, it's all coming up on the next NC Sports Calendar. World Match Racing heads to Marstrand, Sweden for the grand finale of the 2016 Tour from July 4th to 9th with Taylor Canfield and US1 looking poised to capture the title. The American has dominated the standings from the start, but with a cool $1 million up for grabs in the season, don't expect Aussie Salinger Phil Robertson and five-time world champion Williams from the UK, who currently hold the second and third spots respectively, to go down without a fight. The purse is one of the biggest ever in sailing history.
100% sustainable racing returns to Monte Carlo for the third edition of the super successful Monaco Solar Boat Challenge from July 14 to the 16th. Organized by the Yacht Club de Monaco, the competition is open international university teams who work on these vessels year-round. The aim is to guarantee a future where environmental protection and innovation will become one and the same. Ten teams have already signed up, uh, representing Holland, Belgium, Germany, Poland, the USA, and uh, Russia. The men's 2016 WSL Championship Tour returns to Jeffreys Bay, South Africa from July 6 to 17th. While Matt Wilkinson and Gabriel Medina seek to maintain their positions atop the Pro Tour, all eyes will be on Aussie surfer Mick Fanning as he returns from semi-sabbatical to face his demons after being attacked by a shark in J-Bay last year. Stop 6 will also feature Steven Sawyer in a wildcard spot and Stu Kennedy and Sebastian Zietz replacing Owen Wright and Bede Dubridge out on injuries. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for staying with us and we'll catch up next week with all the news, insights and analysis from around the world of water sports. But before we go, we'll leave you with these spectacular shots just in from the 2016 Moth European Championships in Bordeaux. I'm Andy Van Sale and remember, plunge into the action with NC Sports.